noble patricians, patrons of my right, defend the justice of my cause with arms. And countrymen, my loving followers, plead my successive titles with your swords. I am his firstborn son. That was the last that wore the imperial diadem of Rome. Then let my father's honors live in me, nor wrong mine age with this indignity. Romans, friends, followers, favorers of my right, if ever Bassianus, Caesar's son, were gracious in the eyes of royal Rome, keep then this passage to the capital, and suffer not dishonor to approach the imperial seat, to virtue consecrate, to justice, continence, and nobility. But let desert in pure election shine, and Romans, fight for your freedom in your choice. Princes that strive by factions and by friends ambitiously for rule and empery, know that the people of Rome, for whom we stand a special party, have, by common voice in the election of the Roman empery, chosen Andronicus, surnamed Pius, for many good and great deserts to Rome. A nobler man, a braver warrior, was not this day within the city walls. He by the Senate is a seated home from weary wars against the barbarous Goths, that with his sons, a terror to our foes, hath yoked a nation strong, trained up in arms. Ten years are spent since first he undertook this cause of Rome, and chastised with arms our enemy's pride. Five times he hath returned bleeding to Rome, bearing his valiant sons in coffins from the field. And now at last, laden with horror spoils, returns the good Andronicus to Rome, the renowned Titus. Flourishing in arms, let us retreat by honor in his name, who worthily you now succeed. And in the capital and senate's sight, that you, whom you pretend to honor and adore, they withdraw you and abate your strength, dismiss your followers, and as soon as should, lead to deserts in, hum in peace and humbleness. How fair the tribune speaks to calm my thoughts. Marcus Andronicus, so I do affy in thy uprightness and integrity. And so I love and honor thee in thine, thy noble brother Titus and his sons, and her to whom my thoughts are humbled all, gracious Lavinia, Rome's rich ornament, that I will here dismiss my loving friends and to my fortunes and the people's favor commit my cause in balance to be weighed. Friends that have been thus forward in my right, I thank you all and here dismiss you all, and to the love and favor of my country commit myself, my person, and the cause. Rome, be as just and gracious unto me as I am confident and kind to thee. Open the gates and let me in. Tribunes and me, a poor competitor. Romans, make way! The good Andronicus, patron of virtue, Rome's best champion, successful in every battle that he fights, with honor and with virtue, is returned from where he circumscribed with his sword and brought to yoke the enemies of Rome. Hail Rome, victorious in thy morning weeds. Lo, as the bark that hath discharged its fraught returns with precious lading to the bay from whence at first she weighed her anchorage, cometh Andronicus, bound with laurel boughs, to re-salute his country with his tears, tears of true joy for his return to Rome. O great defender of this capital, stand gracious to the rights that we intend. Omens, 
Five and twenty valiant sons, half of the number that King Priam had. Behold, the poor remains, alive and dead. These that survive, let Rome reward with love. These that I bring unto their latest home with burial amongst their ancestors. Your Goths have given me the leave to sheath my sword. Titus, unkind and careless of thine own, why sufferest thou thy sons, unburied yet, to hover on the dreadful shore of Styx? Make way to lay them by their brethren! There greet in silence as the dead are wont, and sleep in peace, slain in your country's wars, O sacred receptacle of my joys, sweet cell of virtue and nobility. How many sons of mine hast thou in store that thou wilt never render to me more? Give us the proudest prisoner of the Goths, that we may hew his limbs, and on a pile Admanus Fratrum sacrifice his flesh before this earthly prison of their bones, that so the shadows be not unappeased, nor we disturbed with prodigies on earth. I give him you, the noblest that survives, the eldest son of this distressed queen. Stay, Roman brethren, gracious conqueror, victorious Titus, Rue the tears I shed, a mother's tears in passion for her son, and if thy sons were ever dear to thee. Oh, think, my son, to be as dear to me. Suffice it not that we are brought to Rome to beautify thy triumphs and return, captive to thee and to thy Roman yoke. But must my sons be slaughtered in the streets for valiant doings in their country's cause? Oh, if to fight for king and commonweal were piety in thine, it is in these, Andronicus, stain not thy tomb with blood. Wilt thou draw near the nature of the gods? Draw near them, then in being merciful? Sweet mercy is nobility's true badge. Thrice, noble Titus, spare my firstborn son. Patient yourself, madam, and pardon me. These are their brethren, whom you Goths beheld, alive and dead, and for their brethren slain, religiously, they ask a sacrifice. To this your son is marked, and die he must, to appease their groaning shadows that are gone. Away with him, and make a fire straight, and with our swords upon a pile of wood, let's hew his limbs till they be clean consumed. O cruel irreligious piety, was ever Scythia so barbarous? Oppose not Scythia with ambitious Rome. Alvarez goes to rest, but we survive to tremble under Tyrus' threatening looks. The madam stand resolve, but hope with all the selfsame gods that arm the queen of Troy with opportunity of sharp revenge under the Thracian tyrant in his tents may favor tomorrow queen of the Goths when Goths were Goths and tomorrow was queen to quit the bloody wrongs upon her foes. See, Lord and Father, how we have performed our Roman rites. Albers limbs and locked in entrails feed the sacrificing fire, whose smoke, like license, doth perfume the sky. Remaineth now but to inter our brethren, and with loud lorums welcome them to Rome. Let it be so, and let Andronicus make his latest farewell to their souls. <laughs> In peace and honor rest you here, my sons, Rome's readiest champions. Repose you here in rest, secure from worldly chances and mishaps. Here lurks no treason, here no envy swells, here grow no damned grudges, here are no storms, no noise, but silence and eternal sleep. In peace and honor rest you here, my sons. In peace and honor lived Lord Titus long, my noble lord and father, live in fame. Lo, at this tomb, my tributary tears I render for my brother's obsequies. And at thy feet I kneel with tears of joy, shed on the earth for thy return to Rome. O oh, bless me here with thy victorious hand, whose fortunes Rome's best citizens applaud. Kind Rome, that hast thus lovingly reserved the cordial of mine age to glad my heart, 
Ah, Lavinia, live, outlive thy father's days, and fame's eternal day for virtue's praise. Long live, Lord Titus, and my beloved brother, gracious triumpher in the eyes of Rome. Thanks, gentle tribune, noble brother Marcus, and welcome nephews from successful wars, you that survive and you that sleep in fame. Fair lords, your fortunes are alike in all that in your country's service drew your swords, but safer triumph is this funeral pomp that hath aspired to Sullen's happiness and triumphs over chance in honor's bed. Titus Andronicus, the people of Rome, whose friend in justice thou hast ever been, send thee by me their tribune and their trust, this parliament of white and spotless hue. And name thee an election for the empire with these our late deceased emperor's sons. Be Candatus then, and put it on, and help to set a head on headless Rome. A better head her glorious body fits than him that shakes from age and feebleness. What should I, I don this robe and trouble you? Uh, be chosen by proclamation today? Tomorrow yield up rule, uh, resign my life, and, and set about new business for you all. Rome, I have been thy soldier for 40 years and set my country's strength successfully and buried one and 20 valiant sons, knighted in field, slain manfully in arms, in right and service of their noble country. Give me a staff of honor for my age, but not a scepter to control the world. Upright lords held he who held it last. Titus, thou shalt obtain and ask the empery. Proud and ambitious tribune, canst thou tell? Patience, Prince Saturninus. Romans, do me right. Patricians, draw your swords and sheathe them not till Saturnus be Rome's emperor. Andronicus, would thou wert shipped to hell rather than rob me of the people's hearts? Proud Saturnine, interrupter of the good that noble minded Titus means to thee. Content thee, Prince. I will restore to thee the people's hearts and wean them from themselves. Andronicus, I, I do not flatter thee, but honor thee, and will do till I die. My faction, if thou strengthen with my friends, I will most thankful be, and thanks to men of noble minds is honorable need. People of Rome, and people's tribunes here, I ask your voices and your suffrages, will you bestow them friendly on Andronicus? gratify the good Andronicus and gratitude his safe return to Rome, the people will accept whom he admits. Tribunes, I thank you. In this suit I make that you create your emperor's eldest son, Lord Saturnine, whose virtues will, I hope, reflect on Rome as titans raise on earth and ripen justice in this commonwealth. Then, if you elect on my advice, Crown him and say, Long live our emperor. With voices and applause of every sort, patricians and plebeians, we create Lord Saturninus, Rome's great emperor, and say, Long live our emperor Saturnine. Andronicus, for thy favors done to us in our election this day, I give thee thanks in part of thy deserts, and will with deeds requite thy gentleness. And, for an onset, Titus, to advance thy name and honorable family, Lavinia will I make my empress. Rome's royal mistress, mistress of my heart, and in the sacred pantheon her espouse. Tell me, Andronicus, does this motion please thee? It doth, my worthy lord, and in this fetch I hold me highly honoured of your grace, and here in sight of Rome, to Saturnine king and commander of our common weal, the wide world's emperor, do I consecrate my sword, my chariot, and my prisoners, presents well worthy of Rome's imperial lord. Receive them then, the tribute that I owe, 
mine honor's ensigns humbled at thy feet. Thanks, noble Titus, father of my life, how proud I am of thee and of thy gifts Rome shall record, and when I do forget the least of these unspeakable deserts, Romans, forget your fealty to me. Now, madam, you are prisoner to an emperor, to him that for your honor and your state will use you nobly and your followers. A goodly lady, trust me, of the hue which I would choose were I to choose a new. <laughs> Clear up, fair queen, that cloudy continence, though chance of war hath wrought this change of cheer, thou comest not to be made a scorn in Rome. Princely shall be thy usage every way. Rest on my word. But let not discontent daunt all your hopes. Madam, he comforts you, can make you greater than the queen of Goths. Lavinia, you are not displeased with this. <laughs> Thanks, sweet Lavinia. Romans! Yes? Let us go. Ransomless here, we set our prisoners free. Proclaim our honors, lords, with trump and drum! Boo. What? Boo, Trump. Fine, no Trump. Just play that funky music. Lord Titus, by your leave, this maid is mine. How, sir? Are you in earnest then, my lord? I, noble Titus, and resolved with all to do myself this reason and this right. Sum quink is our Roman justice. This prince and justice see this but his own. And that he will and shall if Lucius live. Traitors of want, where is the emperor's guard? Treason, my lord, Lavina is surprised. Surprised? By whom? By him that justly may bear his betrothed from all the world away. Brothers, help con convey her heads away, and with my sword I'll keep this door safe. Follow, my lord, and I'll soon bring her back. My lord, you pass not here. What, villain boy, barst my way in Rome? <sighs> help, Lucius, help! My lord, you are unjust, and more than so, in wrongfully quarrel, you have slain your son. Nor thou, nor he, or any son of mine. My sons would never so dishonor me. Traitor, restore Lavinia to thy emperor. Dead, if you will, but not to be his wife. That is another lawful promised love. No, Titus, no. The emperor needs her not, nor her, nor thee, nor any of thy stock. I'll trust by leisure him that mocks me once. Thee never, nor thy traitorous haughty sons, confederates all thus to dishonor me. Was there none else in Rome to make us stale but Saturnine? Full well, Eldronicus, agree these deeds with that proud brag of thine, that saidest I begged the empire at thy hands. O oh, monstrous, what reproachful words are these? But go thy ways. Go. Give that changing peace to him that flourished for her with his sword. A valiant son-in-law thou shalt enjoy. One fit to bandy with thy lawless sons, to ruffle in the commonwealth of Rome. These words are razors to my wounded heart. And therefore, lovely Tamora, queen of Goths, that like the stately Phoebe amongst her nymphs dost overshine the gallant dames of Rome. If thou be pleased with this my sudden choice, to be saved, behold, I choose thee, Tamora, for my bride, and I'll create thee Empress of Rome. Speak, Queen of Goths, dost thou applaud my choice? And here I swear, by all the Roman gods, Sith priest and holy water are so near, and tapers burn so bright, and everything in readiness for Hymenaeus stand, I will not resalute the streets of Rome, or climb my palace, till from forth this place I lead espoused my bride along with me. And here, in sight of heaven, to Rome I swear, if Saturnine advance the Queen of Goths, 
she will a handmaid be to his desires, a loving nurse, a mother to his youth. Ascend, fair queen, Pantheon. Lords, accompany your noble emperor and his lovely bride, sent by the heavens to Prince Saturnus, whose wisdom hath her fortune conquered. There shall we consummate our spousal rites. I am not bid to wait upon this bride, Titus, <laughs> when wart thou wont to walk alone, dishonored thus, and challenged of wrongs. O oh, Titus, see, O oh, what thou hast done, in a bad quarrel, slain a virtuous son, no foolish tribune, no, no son of mine, nor thou, nor these confederates in the deed that hath dishonored all our family, unworthy brother and unworthy sons. But let us give him burial as becomes, give Mucius burial with our brethren. Traitors, away! He rests not in this tomb. This monument five hundred years hath stood, which I have sumptuously re-edified. Here none but soldiers and Rome servitors repose in fame, none basely slain in brawls. Bury him where you can. He comes not here. My lord, this is impiety in you. My nephew Mucius deeds do plead for him. He must be buried with his brethren, and shall, or him we will accompany. And shall, what villain was it that spake that word? He that would vouch it to any place but here. What, would you bury him in my despite? No, noble Titus, but entreat of thee to pardon Mucius and to bury him. Marcus. Even thou hast struck upon my crest, and with these boys mine honor hast thou wounded. My foes, I do repute you every one, so trouble me no more, but get you gone. He is not with himself. Let us withdraw. Not I, till Mutius's bones be buried, brother. For in that name nature doth plead, father, and in that name nature doth speak. Speak thou no more, if all the rest will speed. Renowned Titus, more than half my soul. Dear father, soul and substance of us all. Suffer thy brother Marcus to inter his noble nephew, here in virtue's nest, that died in honor and Lavinia's cause. Thou art a Roman, be not barbarous. The Greeks, upon advice, did bury Ajax that slew himself, and wise Laertes' son did graciously plead for his funerals. Let not young Mutius, then, that was thy joy, be barred his entrance here. Rise, Marcus, rise. The dismalest day is this that e'er I saw, to be dishonored by my sons in Rome. Well, bury him, then bury me the next. There lie thy bones, sweet Mutius, with thy friends, till we with trophies do adorn thy tomb. No man shed tears for noble Mutius. He lives in fame that died in virtue's cause. My lord, to step out of these dreary dumps, how comes it that the subtle queen of Goths is of a sudden thus advanced in Rome? I know not, Marcus, but I know it is. Whether by design or no, the heavens can tell. Is she not then beholding to the man that brought her for this high good turn so far? Yes and will nobly him remunerate. So, Asineus, you have played your prize. God give you joy, sir, of your gallant bride. And you of yours, my lord, I say no more, nor wish no less, and so I take my leave. Traitor! If Rome have law, or we have power, thou and thy faction shall repent this rape. <laughs> Rape call you it, my lord, to seize my own, my true betrothed love, and now my wife. Oh, but let the laws of Rome determine all. Meanwhile, I am possessed of that is mine. 
"'Tis good, sir, you are very short with us, but if we live, we will be as sharp with you." "'My lord, what I have done as best I may, answer I must and shall do with my life. Only thus much I give your grace to know, by all the duties that I owe to Rome, this noble gentleman, Lord Titus here, in my opinion, an honour wronged, that in the rescue of Lavinia, with his own hand, did slay his youngest son, in zeal to you, and highly moved to wrath, to be controlled that he frankly gave. Receive him then to favour, Saturnine, that hath expressed himself in all his deeds, a father and a friend to thee and to Rome. Prince Bassanius, leave to plead my deeds. Tis thou and those who have dishonoured me. Rome and the righteous heavens be my judge, how I have loved and honoured Saturnine. My worthy lord, if ever Tamara were gracious in those princely eyes of thine, then hear me speak indifferently for all, and at my suit, sweet, pardon what is past. What, madam, be dishonoured openly and basely put it up without revenge. Not so, my lord. The gods of Rome forfend I should be author to dishonour you, but on mine honour dare I undertake for good Lord Titus's innocence in all, whose fury, not dissembled, speaks his griefs. Then, at my suit, look graciously on him. Lose not so noble a friend on vain suppose, nor with sour looks afflict his gentle heart. Dissemble all your griefs and discontent. You are but newly planted in your throne, lest then the people and patricians too, upon just survey, take Titus's part and so supplant you for ingratitude. Yielded entreats. Then let me alone. I'll find a day to massacre them all. Raise their family and their faction. The cruel father and his traitorous sons to whom I sued for my own dear son's life. And let them know what tis to let a queen kneel in the street and beg in vain for grace. Come, sweet emperor. Come, Titus. Take up the good old man and cheer the heart that dies in tempest of thy angry frown. Rise, Titus. <laughs> Rise. My empress hath prevailed. I thank you, your majesty, and her, my lord. These words, these looks, infuse new life in me. Titus, I am incorporate in Rome, a Roman now adopted happily, and must advise the emperor for his good. This day, all quarrels die, Andronicus, and let it be mine honour, good my lord, that I have reconciled your friends and you. For you, Prince Bassanius, I have passed my word and promised to the emperor that you will be more mild and tractable. And fear not, lords, and you, Lavinia, by my advice, all humbled on your knees, you shall ask pardon of his majesty. We do, and vow to heaven and to his highness, that what we did was mildly as we might, tendering our sister's honor as our own. That, on mine honor, here I do protest. <laughs> Retirez-vous, et ne me parlez plus, ne m'importunez plus. No, no, je le remparer. Il faut que nous soyons tous amis. Le tribu et ses nerveux vous demandent grâce à genoux. Vous ne refuserez pas, cher époux. Ramenez vos égales sur eux. Marcus, à ta considération à celle de ton frère Titus, et cédant aux sollicitations de Tamora, je pardonne à ces jeunes gens leurs attentats odieux. Levez-vous, Lavinia, quoique vous m'ayez abandonné comme un rustre. J'ai trouvé un ami et j'ai juré par la mort que je ne quitterai pas la prêtre sans être marié. Venez, si la cour est de l'empereur que fêter de marier, vous serez convives, Lavinia, vous et vos amis. Ce jour serait tout entier à l'amour, Tamora. 
votre main, si c'est le bon plaisir de votre majesté, que nous chassions le, la pantale et le sort ensemble, nous irons donner à votre majesté le bon jour avec les corps et les mains. Volontiers, Titus, et je vous en remercie. Sortons Now climbeth Tamara Olympus top, safe out of fortune's shot, and sits aloft, secure of thunder's crack or lightning flash, advanced above pale envy's threatening reach, as when the golden sun salutes the morn, and having gilt the ocean with his beams, gallops the zodiac in his glistering coach, and overlooks the highest peering hills. So Tamara, upon her wit doth earthly honor wait, and virtue stoops and trembles at her frown. Then, Aaron, arm thy heart and fit thy thoughts to mount aloft with thy imperial mistress, and mount her pitch, whom thou in triumph long hast prisoner held, fettered in amorous chains and faster bound to Aaron's charming eyes than is Prometheus tied to Caucasus, Away with slavish weeds and servile thoughts. I will be bright and shine in pearl and gold to wait upon this new-made empress. To wait, said I, to wanton with this queen, this goddess, this Semiramis, this nymph, this siren that will charm Rome's Saturnine and see his shipwreck and his common wheels. Hello, ah, what storm is this? Chiron, thy years want wit, thy wit wants edge, and manners to intrude where I am graced, and may, for aught thou know'st, affected be. Demetrius, thou dost overween in all, and so in this to bear me down with braves. Tis not the difference of a year or two makes me less gracious or thee more fortunate. I am as able and as fit as thou to serve, and to deserve my mistress's grace. And that my sword upon thee shall approve, and plead my passions for Lavinia's love. Clubs, clubs, these lovers will not keep the peace. Why, boy, although a mother unadvised gave you a dancing rapier by your side, are you so desperate grown to threat your friends? Go to you, have your laugh lewd within your sheath, till you know better how to handle it. Meanwhile, sir, with the little skill I have, full well shalt thou perceive how much I dare. Aye, boy. Grow you so brave? Why, how now, lords? So near the Emperor's palace dare you draw, and maintain such a quarrel openly? For well, I wot the ground of all this grudge, I would not for a million of gold. Uh, the clouds were known to them in most concerns, nor would your noble mother for much uh, more be so dishonoured in the court of Rome. Uh, for shame, put up. Not, not I, till I have sheathed my rapier in his bosom and withal. Thrust these reproachful speeches down his throat, that he hath breathed in my dishonor here. For that I am prepared and full resolved, foul spoken coward that thunderst with thy tongue, and with thy weapon nothing darest perform. Away, I say, now by the gods that warlike goths adore, this petty brabble will undo us all. Why, lords, and think you not how dangerous it is to jet upon a prince's right? What, is Lavinia then become so loose, or Bassiana so degenerate? that for her love such quarrels may be broached without controlment, justice, or revenge? Young lords, beware, and should the empress know this discord's ground, the music would not please. I care not, I knew she in all the world, I love Lavinia more than all the world. Youngling, learn thou to make some meaner choice, Lavinia is thine elder brother's hope. Why, are ye mad? Or know ye not in Rome how furious and impatient they be, and cannot brook competitors in love? I tell you, lords, you do but plot your deaths by this device. Therein a thousand deaths would I propose to achieve her whom I love. To achieve her how? Why makest thou it so strange? She is a woman, therefore may be wooed. She is a woman, therefore may be won. She is Lavinia, therefore must be loved. What man more water gildeth by the mill than wots the miller of? And easy it is of a cut loaf to steal a shive, we know. Though Bassanius be the emperor's brother, better than he have worn Vulcan's badge. Aye, and as good as Saturninus may. Then why should he despair who knows to court it with words 
fair looks and liberality. What, hast not thou full often struck a doe and borne her cleanly by the keeper's nose? Why then it seems some certain snatch or so would serve your terms. Aye, so the turn was served. Aaron, thou hast hit it. But you had hit it too. And should not we be tired with this ado? Why, hark ye, hark ye. And are you such fools to square for this? Would it offend you then that both should speak? Faith, not me. Nor me, so I were one. For shame, be friends and join for that you jar. Tis policy and stratagem must do that you affect, and so must you resolve. That what you cannot as you would achieve, you must perforce accomplish as you may. Take this of me. Lucrece was not more chaste than this Lavinia, Bassianus love. A speedier course than lingering languishment. Must we pursue? And I have found the path. My lords, a solemn hunting is in hand. There will the lovely Roman ladies troop. The forest walks are wide and spacious, and many unfrequented plots there are. Fitted by kind for rape and villainy, single you thither than this dainty doe, and strike her home by force, if not by words. This way, or not at all, stand you in hope. Come, come, our empress, with her sacred wit, to villainy and vengeance consecrate. Will we acquaint withal what we intend? And she shall file our engines with advice that will not suffer you to square yourselves, but to your wishes, height, advance you both. Sit fast, Alnithus, till I find the stream to cool this heat, a charm to calm these fits. Perstiga! Per manus vihor. The hunt is up. The moon is bright and gray. The fields are fragrant and the woods are green. Uncouple here and let us make a bay. And wake the emperor and his lovely bride. And rouse the prince and ring a hunter's peal. That all the court may echo with the noise. Sons, let it be your charge as it is ours. To attend the emperor's person carefully. I have been troubled in my sleep this night, but dawning day new comfort has inspired. Many good morrows to your majesty, madam. To you as many as good, I promise your grace a hunter's peel. You have rung it lustfully, my lord, and somewhat cheerily for new married ladies. <laughs> Lavina, how say you? I say no. I've been broad awake for two hours and more. Well, come on then, horses, chariots, let's have to our sport. Madam, now shall we see the Roman hunting. I have dogs, my lord. We'll rouse the proudest panther in the chase incline to the top. And I have horse, will follow where the game makes way, and run like swallows o'er the plain. Chiron, we hunt not we with horse nor hound, but hope to pluck a dainty doe to ground. He that had wit would think that I had none, to bury so much gold under a tree, and yet never after to inherit it. Let him that thinks of me so abjectly know that this gold must coin a stratagem, which cunningly effective will beget. A very excellent piece of villainy, and so repose sweet gold, for their unrest, they have their alms beneath the empress chest. My lovely Aaron, wherefore thou look so sad, when everything doth make a gleeful boast? The birds chant melody on every bush, the snake lies rolled in the cheerful sun, the green leaves quiver with the cooling wind, and make a checkered shadow on the ground. Under their sweet shade, Aaron, let us sit. And whilst the babbling echo mocks the hounds, replying shrilly to the well-tuned horns, as if a double hunt were heard at once, 
let us sit down and mark their yelping noise. And after conflict such as was supposed the wandering prince and Dido once enjoyed, when with a happy storm they were surprised and curtained with a council-keeping cave, we may, each wreathed in the other's arms, our pastimes done, possess a golden slumber, whilst hounds and horns and sweet melodious birds be unto us, as is a nurse's song of lullaby to bring her babe asleep. Madam, though Venus govern your desires, Saturn is dominator over mine. What signifies my deadly standing eye, my silence and my cloudy melancholy, my fleece of woolly hair that now uncurls, even as an adder when she doth unroll to do some fatal execution? No, madam, these are no venereal signs. Vengeance is in my heart, death in my hand. Blood and revenge are hammering in my head. Hark to Mora, the empress of my soul which never hopes more heaven than rests in thee. This is the day of doom for Basialis. This Philomel must lose her tongue today. Thy sons make pillage of her chastity and wash their hands in Basialis' blood. Seest thou this letter? Take it up, I pray thee, and give the king this fatal plotted scroll. Now, question me no more. We are despised. Here comes a parcel of our hopeful booty which dreads not their lives' destruction. Ah, oh, my sweet more, sweeter to me than life. No more, great empress. Vasianus comes, be cross with him, and I'll go fetch thy sons to back thy quarrels, whatsoever they be. Who have we here? Rome's royal empress, unfurnished of her well-beseeming troop? Or is it Diane, habited like her, who hath abandoned her holy groves to see the general hunting in the forest? Saucy controller of our private steps. Had I the power that some say Diane had, thy temple should be planted presently with horns, as was Actian's, and the hound should drive upon thy new transformed limbs, unmannerly intruder as thou art. Under your patience, gentle empress, "'Tis thought that you have a goodly gift in horning, "'and to be doubted that your moor and you "'are singled forth to try experiments. "'Jove, shield your husband from his hounds today. "'Tis pity they should take him for a stag. "'Believe me, queen, your sore Cimmerian "'doth make your honor of his body's hue, "'spotted, detested, and abominable. "'Who are you sequestered from all your train, "'dismounted from your snow-white goodly steed, and wandered hither through, through an obscure plot, accompanied with the barbarous moor, if foul desire had not conducted you. And being intercepted in your sport, good reason that my noble lord be rated for sauciness, I pray you let us hence, and let her joy raven co colored love in this valley purpose passing well. My king, the king my brother, shall have notice of this. I, for these slips have made him noted long, good king, to be so mightily abused why I have the patience to endure all this. How now, dear sovereign and our gracious mother, why doth your highness look so pale and wane? Have I not reason you think you to look pale? These two have ticed me hither to this place, a barren, detested vale, you see it is. The trees, though summer yet forlorn and lean, are come with moss and baleful mistletoe. Here never shines the sun. Here nothing breeds, unless the nightly owl or fatal raven. And when they showed me this abhorred pit, they told me, here, at dead time of the night, a thousand fiends, a thousand hissing snakes, ten thousand swelling toads, as many urchins, would make such fearful and confused cries that any mortal body hearing it should straight fall mad, or else die suddenly. No sooner had they told this hellish tale, but straight they told me they would bind me here unto the body of a dismal you, and leave me to this miserable death. And then they called me foul, adulterous, lascivious goth, and all the bitterest of terms that ever ear did hear to such effect. Have you not by wondrous fortune come this vengeance upon me they had executed? Revenge it, as you love your mother's life, or be ye not henceforth called my children. This is a witness that I am thy son. 
And this for me struck home to show my strength. I, Shemeritus, nay, barbarous Tamora, for no name fits thy nature but thy own. Give me thy poniard. You shall know, my boys, your mother's hand shall right your mother's wrong. Stay, madam. Here's more belongs to her. First thrash the corn, then after burn the straw. This minion stood upon her chastity, upon her nuptial vow, her loyalty, and with that painted hope braves your mightiness, and shall she carry this unto her grave? And if she do, I word, I were an eunuch, drag hence her husband to some secret hole, and make his dead trunk pillow to our lust. But when ye have the honey ye desire, let not this wasp outlive us both to sting. I warrant you, madam, we will, I make that sure. Come, mistress, now perforce we will enjoy that nice preserved honesty of yours. O oh, Tamara, thou bearest a woman's face. I will not hear her speak. Away with her. Sweet lords, entreat her hear me but a word. Listen, fair maiden, let it be your glory to see her tears, but be your heart to them as unrelenting flint to drops of rain. When did the tiger's young ones teach the dam? Oh, do not learn her wrath, she taught it thee. The milk thou suckst from her did turn to marble, even at thy teeth thou hadst thy tyranny. Yet every mother breeds not sons alike. Do thou entreat her, show a woman pity. What? Wouldst thou have me prove myself a bastard? Tis true, the raven doth not hatch a lark. Yet have I heard, oh, could I find it now? The lion moved with pity did endure. To have his princely paws paid all the way. Some say that ravens foster forlorn children, though whilst their own birds famish in their nests. Oh, be to me, though thou hard heart say no, nothing so kind but something so pitiful. I know not what it means. Away with her! Oh, let me teach thee, for my father's sake that gave thee life when he might well have slain thee. Be not obdurate, open thine deaf ears. Hadst thou in person ne'er offended me, even for his sake am I pitiless. Remember, boys, how I have poured forth tears in vain to save your brother from the sacrifice, but fierce Andronicus would not relent. Therefore, away with her, and use her as you will, the worse for her, the better loved by me. O oh, Tamara, be called a gentle queen, and with thine own hands kill me in this place. For tis not life that I've begged so long. Poor I was slain when Bassianus died. What begst thou then? <laughs> Fond woman, let me go. Tis present death I beg. And one thing more, that womanhood denies my tongue to speak. Oh, keep me from their worse than killing lust, and tumble me into some loathsome pit where never man's eye may behold my body. Do this, and be a charitable murderer. <laughs> so, should I rob my sweet sons of their fee? No, let them satisfy their lust on thee. <gasps> Away, thou dost stay here too long. No grace, no womanhood, a beastly creature. The blood and enemy to her general name. Confusion fall. Nay, then I'll stop your mouth. Bring thou her husband. <gasps> this hole that Aaron built us bid hide him. <laughs> Farewell, my sons. See that you make her sure. Ne'er let my heart no merry cheer indeed, till all the Andronici be made away. Ooh, now will I hence to seek my lovely moor. Mm, yeah. mm.
and let my spleenful sons this troll <laughs> deflower. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Come on, my lord, the better foot before. Straight I will bring you to the loathsome pit where I spied the panther fast asleep. My sight is very dull, whatever it bodes. And mine, I promise you. Were it not for shame, well could I leave our sport to sleep a while. Oh, what art thou fallen? What subtle hole is this whose mouth is covered with rude growing briars upon whose leaves are drops of new shed blood as fresh as morning dew distilled on flowers? A very fatal place it seems to me. Speak, brother, hast thou hurt thee with the fall? Oh, brother, with the dismalest object hurt that ever I with sight made heart lament. Now will I fetch the king to find them here, that he hereby may give a likely guess how these were they that made away his brother. Why dost thou not comfort me and help me out from this unhallowed and blood-stained hole? I am surprised with an uncouth fear. A chilling sweat overruns my trembling joints. My heart suspects more than mine eye can see. To prove thou hast a true divining heart, Aaron and thou look down into this den and see a fearful sight of blood and death. Aaron is gone, and my compassionate heart will not permit mine eyes once to behold. The thing whereat it trembles by surmise. Oh, tell me how it is, for never till now was I a child to fear. I know not what. Lord Bassanius lies embrued here, all on a heap like to a slaughtered lamb in this detested, dark, blood-drinking pit. If it be dark, how dost thou know tis he? Upon his bloody finger he doth wear a precious ring that lightens all the whole, which, like a taper in some monument, doth shine upon the dead man's earthy cheeks, and shows the ragged entrails of the pit. Goodness. Oh, oh, so pale did shine the moon on Pyramus when he by night lay bathed in maiden blood. Oh, brother, help me with thy fainting hand. If fear hath made thee faint as me it hath, out of this foul devouring receptacle, as hateful as cocutus misty mouth. Reach me thy hand that I may help thee out, or wanting strength to do thee so much good. I may be plucked into the swallowing womb of this deep pit, poor Bassiano's grave. Oh, I have no strength to pluck thee to the brink. Oh, nor I no strength to climb without thy help. Thy hand once more I will not loose again till thou art here aloft or I below. Thou canst not come to me, I come to thee. Along with me. I'll see what hole is here, and what he is now that has leapt into it. Say, who art thou that lately didst descend into this gaping hollow of the earth? Uh, the unhappy sons of old Andronicus, uh, brought hither in a most unlucky hour, uh, to find thy brother Bassius uh, dead. <gasps> My brother dead? I know thou dost but jest. He and his lady are both at the lodge upon the north side of this pleasant chase. Tis but an hour since I left them there. Uh, we know not where you left them all alive. But alas, here we have found him dead. Where is my lord, the king? Here, Tamara, though grieved with killing grief. Where is thy brother, Bassius? Now to the bottom thou dost search my wound. Poor Bassius lies there, murdered! Then all too late I bring this fatal writ, the complot of this timeless tragedy, and wonder greatly that man's face can fold in pleasing smiles such murderous tyranny. And if we miss to meet him handsomely, sweet huntsman, Bassianus tis we mean, do thou so much as dig the grave for him, thou know'st our meaning. Look for thy reward among the nettles at the elder tree, which overshades the mouth of that same pit where we decreed to bury Bassianus. Do this, and purchase us thy lasting friends. O Tamora, 
Was ever heard the like? This is the pit, and this the elder tree. Look, sirs, if you can find the huntsman out that should have murdered Bassianus here. My gracious lord, here is the bag of gold. Two of thy whelps, fell curs of bloody kind, have here bereft my brother of his life. Sirs, drag him from the pit unto the prison. There let them bide until we have devised some never heard of torturing pain for them. What? Are they in this pit? A wondrous thing, how easily murder is discovered. Hi, Emperor. Upon my feeble knee, I beg this boon, with tears not lightly shed, that this fell fault of my accursed sons, accursed if the fault in them be proved. If it be proved, you see it is apparent who found this letter. Tamara, was it you? Andronicus himself did take it up. I did, my lord, yet let me be their bail, for by my father's reverend tomb I vow they shall be ready at your highness's will to answer their suspicion with their lives. Thou shalt not bail them. See thou, follow me. Some bring the murdered body, some the murderers. Let them not speak a word. The guilt is plain. For by my soul, were their worse end than death, that end upon them should be executed. Andronicus, I will entreat the king. Fear not their sons. They will do well enough. Come, Lucius, come. Stay not to talk with them. So, now go tell, and if thy tongue can speak, who twas that cut thy tongue and ravished thee? Write down thy mind, bewry thy meaning so, and if thy stumps will let thee play the scribe. <laughs> Seeing how with signs and tokens she can scrawl. Go home, call for sweet water. Wash thy hands. <laughs> wash thy hands. She has no tongue to speak, nor hands to wash, so let us leave her to her silent walks. And to her my case, I'd go and hang myself. Hands knit the cord. <laughs> oh, who is this? My niece that flies away so fast. Cousin, a word, where is your husband? If I do dream, would all my wealth would wake me. If I do wake, some planet strike me down that I might slumber in eternal sleep. Speak, gentle niece. What stern, ungentle hands have lopped and hewed and made thy body bare of her two branches? Those sweet ornaments whose circling shadows kings have sought to sleep in, and might not find so great a happiness as have thy love. Why dost not speak to me? Alas, the crimson river of warm blood, like to a bubbling fountain stirred with wind, doth rise and fall between thy rosed lips coming and going with thy honey breath. But sure, some tedious hath deflowered thee, and lest thou shouldst detect him, cut thy tongue. Ah, now thou turnst away thy face for shame, and notwithstanding all this loss of blood as from a conduit with three issuing spouts, yet do thy cheeks look red as Titan's face, blushing to be encountered with a cloud. Shall I speak for thee? Shall I say tis so? Oh, that I knew thy heart, and knew the beast that I might rail at him to ease my mind. Sorrow concealed, like an oven stopped, doth burn a heart to cinders where it is. Fair Philomela, she but lost her tongue, and in a tedious sampler sewed her mind. But lovely niece, that mean is cut from thee. A crafter Tereus hast thou met, and he hath cut those pretty fingers off that could have better sewn than Philomel. Oh, had the monster seen those lily hands tremble like aspen leaves upon a lute and make the silken strings <laughs> delight to kiss them, he would not have touched them for his life. Or had he heard the heavenly harmonies that thy sweet tongue hath made, he would have dropped his knife and fallen asleep 
like Cerberus at the Thracian poet's feet. Come, let us go and make thy father blind, for such a sight will blind a father's eye. One hour's storm will drown the fragrant meads. What will one month of tears thy father's eye? Do not draw back, for we will mourn with thee. Oh, could our mourning ease thy misery? Hear me, grave fathers, noble tribunes, stay! For pity of mine age, whose youth was spent in dangerous wars, whilst you slept. For all my blood in Rome's great quarrel shed, for all the frosty nights that I have watched, and for these bitter tears, which now you see, filling the aged wrinkles in my cheeks. Be pitiful to my condemned sons, whose souls are not as corrupted as tis thought. For two and twenty sons I never wept, because they died in honor's lofty bed. For these, these tribunes in the dust I write, my heart's deep languor and my soul's sad tears. Let my tears stanch the earth's dry appetite. My son's sweet blood will make it shame and blush. O oh, earth, I will befriend thee with more rain that shall distill from these two ancient urns. Then youthful April shall with all his showers. In summer's drought I'll drop upon thee still. In winter, with warm tears, I'll melt the snow and keep eternal springtime on thy face, so thou refuse to drink my dear son's blood. Oh, reverend tribunes, O oh, gentle aged men, unbind my sons, reverse the doom of death, and let me say that never wept before, my tears are now prevailing orators. Oh, noble father, you lament in vain. The tribunes hear you not. No man is by, and you recount your sorrows to a stone. Ah, Lucius, for thy brothers let me plead. Grave tribunes, once more I entreat of you. My gracious lord, no one hears you speak. Why, tis no matter, man. If they did hear, they would not mark me. Or if they did mark, they would not pity me. Yet plead I must. Therefore I tell my sorrows to the stones, who, though they cannot answer my distress, yet in some sort they are better than the tribunes, for that they will not intercept my tale. When I do weep, they humbly at my feet receive my tears and seem to weep with me. And were they but a tyrant in grave weeds, Rome could afford no tribune like to these. A stone is soft as wax. Tribunes much more hard than stones. A stone is silent and offendeth not, and tribunes with their tongues do men to death. But wherefore standest thou with thy weapon drawn? To rescue my two brothers from their death, for which attempt the judges have pronounced my everlasting doom of banishment. O oh, happy man that they have befriended thee, why, foolish Lucius, dost thou not perceive that Rome is but a wilderness of tigers? Tigers must pray, and Rome affords no prey but me and mine. How happy thou art, then, from these devourers to be banished. But who comes with our brother Marcus here? Titus, prepare thy aged eyes to weep, or if not so, thy noble heart to break. I bring consuming sorrow with thine age. Will it consume me? Let me see it, then. This was thy daughter, where Marcus so she is. I, the subject, kills me. Faint-hearted boy, arise and look on her. Speak, Lavinia, what cursed hand hath made thou handless in thy father's sight? What fool hath added water to the sea or brought a faggot to bright burning Troy? My grief was at the height before thou camest, and now, like Nihilus, it disdaineth bounds. Give me a sword. I'll chop off my hands, too, for they have fought for Rome and all in vain, and they have nursed this woe in feeding life in 
bootless prayer have they been held up, and they have served me in effectless use. Now, all the service I require of them is that the one will help to cut the other. Tis well, Lavinia, that thou hast no hands, for hands to do Rome's service are but vain. Speak, gentle sister, who hath martyred thee? Oh, that delightful engine of her thoughts that blabbed them with such pleasing eloquence is torn forth from that pretty hollow cage where, like a sweet and melodious bird, it sung sweet varied notes, enchanting every ear. Oh, say thou for her, who hath done this deed? Oh, uh, thus I found her, straying in the park, seeking to hide herself, as doth the deer that hath received some unrecurring wound. It was my deer, and he that wounded her hath hurt me more than had he killed me dead. For now I stand as one upon a rock environed with the wilderness of sea who marks the waxing tide grow wave by wave, expecting ever when some envious surge will in his brinish bowels swallow him. This way to death my wretched sons are gone. Here stand my other son, a banished man, and here my brother weeping at my woes. But that which gives my soul the greatest Spurn is dear Lavinia, dearer than my soul. Had I but seen thy picture in this plight, it would have maddened me. What shall I do now I behold thy lively body so? <laughs> Thou hast no hands to wipe away thy tears, nor tongue to tell me who hath martyred thee. Thy husband is dead, and for his death thy brothers are condemned, and dead by this. <sighs> look, Marcus, ah, uh, son Lucius, look on her. When I did name her brothers, then fresh tears stood on her cheeks, as doth the honeydew upon the gathered lily almost withered. Perchance she weeps because they killed her husband, perchance because she knows them innocent. If they did kill thy husband, then be joyful, because the law hath taken revenge on them. No, no, they would not do so foul a deed. Witness the sorrow that their sister makes. Gentle Lavinia, let me kiss thy lips, or make some sign how I may do thee ease. Shall thy good uncle, and thy brother Lucius, and thou and I, sit round about some fountain, looking all downwards to behold our cheeks, how they are stained as meadows, yet not dry, with the miry slime left on them by a flood? And at the fountain shall we gaze so long that the fresh taste be taken from its clearness and made a brine pit with our bitter tears? Or shall we cut our hands away like thine? Or shall we bite our tongues and in dumb show pass the remainder of our hateful days? What shall we do? Shall we that have our tongues plot some dish advance to misery to make us wonder that in time to come? Sweet father, cease your tears, for in your grief, see how my wretched sister sobs and weeps. <laughs> Patience, dear niece. Good Titus, dry thine eyes. Oh, Marcus. Marcus, brother, well I wot thou napkin canst drink up no tear of mine, since thou, poor man, hast drowned it with thine own. <laughs> oh, my Lavinia, let me dry thy cheeks. Mark, Marcus, Mark, I understand her signs. Had she a tongue to speak now, would she say that to her brother, which I said to thee, his napkin with his true tears all bewept can do no service on her sorrowful cheeks. Oh, what a sympathy of woe is this, as far from help as limbo is from bliss. Titus Andronicus, 
My lord, the emperor sends thee his word, that if thou love thy sons, let Marcus Lucius or thyself, old Titus, or any one of you chop off your hand, and send it to the king. He, for the same, will send thee hither both thy sons alive, and that shall be the ransom for their faults. Oh, gracious emperor, oh, gentle Aaron, did ever raven sing so like a lark that gives thee sweet tidings of the sun's uprise? With all my heart, I'll send the emperor my hand. Good Aaron, would thou help to chop it off? Stay, father, for that noble hand of thine that hath thrown down so many enemies shall not be sent. My hand will serve the turn. My youth can better spare my blood than you, and therefore mine shall save my brother's lives. Which of your hands hath not defended Rome, and feared aloft the bloody battle axe, writing destruction on the enemy's castle? Oh, none of both but are of highest desert. My hand hath been but idle. Let it serve to ransom my two nephews from their death. Then have I kept it to a worthy end. Nay, come, agree, whose hand shall go along for fear they die before their pardon come. My hand shall go. By heaven, it shall not go. <coughs> Sirs! Strive no more. Such withered herbs as these are meat for plucking up, and therefore mine. Sweet father, if I shall be thought thy son, let me redeem my brothers both from death. And for our father's sake and mother's care, now let me show a brother's love to thee. Agree between you, I will spare my hand. Then I'll go fetch an axe. But I will use the axe. Come hither, Aaron, I'll deceive them both. Lend me thy hand, and I will give thee mine. If that be called deceit, I will be honest, and never whilst I live deceive men so. But I'll deceive you in another sort, and that you will say, ere half an hour pass. Cut off Titus's hand. Now say your strife, what shall be is dispatched. Good Aaron, give his majesty thy hand. Tell it him it was a hand that warded him from thousand dangers. Bid him bury it more half it merited than let it have. As for my sons, say I account of them, as jewels purchased at an easy price, and yet dear too, because I bought mine own. I go, Andronicus. And for thy hand, look by and by to have thy sons with thee. Their heads, I mean. Oh, how this villainy doth fat me with the very thoughts of it. Let fools do good, and fair men call for grace. Aaron will have his soul black like his face. Oh, here I lift this one hand up to heaven, and bow this feeble ruin to the earth. If any power pities wretched tears, to that I call. What? Will thou kneel with me? Do then, dear heart, for heaven shall hear our prayers, or with our sighs will breathe the welkin din, and stain the sun with fog, sometime clouds, and do they hug him in their melting bosoms? O oh, brother, speak with possibilities, and do not break into these deep extremes. Is not my sorrow deep, having no bottom? Then be my passions bottomless with them. But yet let reason govern thy lament. If there were reason for these miseries, then into limits I could bind my woes. When heaven doth weep, doth not the earth o'erflow? If the winds rage, doth not the sea wax mad, threatening the welkin with his big swollen face? And wilt thou have a reason for this coil? I am the sea, hark how her sighs do blow. She is the weeping welkin, I the earth. Then must my sea be moved with her sighs. Then must my earth with her continual tears become a deluge, o'erflowed and drowned. 
for why my bowels cannot hide her woes, but like a drunkard I must vomit them. Then give me leave, for losers will have leave to ease their stomachs with their bitter tongues. What, the Andronicus? The life thou repaid for that good hand thou sentest the emperor. Here are thy heads of thy two noble sons, and here's thy hand in scorn to thee sent back. Thy griefless sports, thy resolution mocked. That woe is me to think upon thy woes, more than remembrance of my father's death. Now let hot Edna cool in Sicily, and be my heart in ever burning hell. These miseries are more than may be borne. To weep with them that weep doth ease some deal, but sorrow flouted is as double death. Uh, that this sight should make so deep a wound, and yet detested life do not shrink thereat, that death should let life bear his name, where life hath no more interest but to breathe. Alas, poor heart, that kisses comfortless as frozen water to a starved snake. When will this fearful slumber have an end? Now farewell, flattery. Die, Andronicus, thou dost not slumber. See thy two sons' heads, thy warlike hand, thy mangled daughter here, thy... Other banished son with this dear sight struck pale and bloodless? And thy brother, I, even like a stony image, cold and numb. And now no more will I control thy grief, rend off thy silver hair, thy other hand gnawing with thy teeth, and be this dismal sight the closing of our most wretched eyes. Now is the time to storm. Why art thou still? <laughs> Why dost thou laugh, if it's not with this hour? Why, I have not another tear to shed. Besides, this sorrow is an enemy, and would usurp upon my watery eye and make them blind with tributary tears. And then which way shall I find revenge's cave? For these two heads seem to speak to me and threat me. I shall never come to bliss till all these mischiefs be returned again even in their throats that have committed them. Come, let me see what task I have to do. You heavy people, circle me about, that I may turn to each of you and swear unto my soul to right your wrong. And vow is made. Come, come together, brother. Take a head. And in this hand, the other I will bear. Lavinia, thou shalt be employed these arms. Bear thou my hand, sweet wrench between your teeth. As for thee, boy, go get thee from my sight. Thou art in exile, and thou must not stay. Hie to the Goths and raise an army there, and if you love me as I think you do, let's kiss and part, for we have much to do. Mm. Hmm. Farewell, Adronicus, my noble father, the wofulest man that ever lived in Rome. And farewell, proud Rome, to Lucius come again. He leaves his pledges dearer than his life. Farewell, Lavinia, my noble sister. Oh, would thou wert as thou tofore hast been. <laughs> But now, nor Lucius nor Lavinia lives, but in oblivion and hateful griefs. If Lucius live, he will requite your wrongs, and make proud Saturnine and his empress beg at the gates like Tarkin and his queen. And now will I to the Goths and raise a power to be revenged on Rome and Saturnine. So, so, now sit down, and look you, eat no more than just so much as will preserve so much strength in us as will revenge these bitter woes of ours. <laughs> Marcus, unknit 
that sorrow wreathe in not. Thy niece and I, poor creatures, want our hands and cannot passionate our tenfold sighs with folded arms. This poor right hand of mine is left to tyrannize upon my breast, who, when my heart all mad with misery beats in this hollow prison of my flesh, then thus I thump it down. Thou map of woe, and thus dost talk in signs. Well, when thy poor heart beats with outrageous beating, thou canst not strike it thus to make it still. Wound it with sighing, girl. Kill it with groans. Or get some little knife between thy teeth and just against thy heart make thou a hole that all the tears that thy poor eyes let fall may run into that sink and soaking in drown the lamenting fool in sea salt tears. Fie, brother, fie. Teach her not thus to lay such violent hands upon her tender life. How now? Has sorrow made thee dote already? Why, Marcus, no man should be mad but I. What violent hands can she lay on her life? Ah, uh, wherefore dost thou urge the name of hands to bid Aeneas tell the tale twice o'er how Troy was burnt and he made miserable? Oh, handle not the theme to talk of hands, lest we remember still that we have none. Fie, fie, how frantically I square my talk, as if we should forget we had no hands if Marcus did not name the word of hands. Come, let's fall to, and, gentle girl, eat this. Here is no drink. Hark, Marcus, what she says. I can interpret all her martyred signs. She says she drinks no other drink but tears, brewed with sorrow, meshed upon her cheeks. Speechless complainer, I will learn thy thought, and thy dumb action will I be as perfect as begging hermits and their holy prayers. Thou shalt not sigh, nor hold thy stumps to heaven, nor wink, nor nod, nor kneel, nor make a sign. But I of these will rest in alphabet, and by still practice learn to know thy meaning. Good grandsire, leave these bitter deep laments, and make my aunt merry with some pleasing tale. Alas, the tender boy in passion moves doth weep to see his grandsire's heaviness. Peace, tender sapling. Thou art made of tears, and tears will quickly melt thy life away. What dost thou strike at, Marcus, with thy knife? At that that I have killed, my lord, a fly. Out on thee, murderer, thou killst my heart. My eyes are cloyed with tyranny. A deed of death done on the innocent becomes not Titus's brother. Get thee gone. I can see. Thou art not from my company. Alas, my lord, I have but killed a fly. But how if that fly had a father and a mother? How would he hang his slender gilded wings and buzz lamenting doings in the air? Poor harmless fly. That was his pretty, pretty buzzing melody. Come to give us Mary. And thou hast killed him. Pardon me, sir. It was a black, ill favored fly. Like to impress more three fool. Uh, therefore, I killed him. Oh, well, pardon me for reprehending you. Thou hast done a charitable deed. Give me that knife. I will insult on him. Flattering myself as if it were the more his self coming here to purposely to poison me. There's for you thyself. And that's for tomorrow. Ah, sirrah. Yet I think we are not brought so low, but that between us we can kill a fly that comes in likeness of a coal-black moor. 
Alas, poor man! Grief has so wrought on him he takes false shadows for true substances! Waka waka! Come, take away Lavinia, go with me, out to thy closet, and go read with thee sad stories chanced in the times of old. Come, boy, and go with me, thy sight is young, and thou shalt read when mine begin to dazzle. Sire, help! My Aunt Lavinia follows me everywhere. I know not why. Good Uncle Marcus, see how swift she comes. Alas, sweet aunt, I know not what you mean! Stand by me, Lucius. Do not fear thine aunt. She loves thee, boy, too well to do thee harm. Aye, when my father was in Rome, she did. What means my niece Lavinia by these signs? Fear not, Lucius, somewhat doth she mean. Doth she mean. See, Lucia, see how much she makes of thee. Some whither would she have thee go with her. Ah, boy, Cornelio never with more care read to her sons than has she read to thee. Sweet poetry in Tully's orates. Hast thou not guessed where, why she plies thee thus? My lord, I know not, nor can I guess, unless some fit of frenzy does possess her. For I have heard my grandsire say full oft, extremity of griefs would make men mad. And I have read that Hecuba of Troy ran mad through sorrow that made me to fear. Although, my lord, I know my noble aunt, she loves me as dear as ever my mother did, and would not, but in fury, fright my youth. Which made me fly down to throw my books and fly, castles perhaps, but part of me, sweet aunt, and madam, if my uncle Marcus go, I will most willingly attend your ladyship. Lucius, I will. Princess, some book there is that she desires to see. Which is, girl, of these? Open them, boy. But thou art deeper read, and better skilled. Come, and take thy choice of my library, and so beguile thee with sorrow till the heavens reveal the damned contriver of the dead, and why she lifts up her arms in sequence of thee. I think she means that there was more than one confederate of the fact, aye, more than was, or else heaven she and heaven them her revenge. Lucius, what book has is she taught us so? Grandsire, tis of its metamorphoses. My mother gave it to me. To love of her that's gone, perhaps she called it from among the rest. Soft. See how busily she turns the leaves. What would she find? Lavinia, shall I read? This is the tragic tale of Philemon, and traits of tears as treason, and of his rape. And rape I fear, is root of thine annoy. See, brother, see. Note, note how she quotes the leaves. Lavinia. Would thou thus repice, sweet girl, ravished and wronged, as Philomela was, forced in the ruthless, vast and gloomy wood? See, see, ay, such place there is, where we did hunt. Oh, had we never, never hunted there. Pageant by that the poet he describes, by nature made for murders and rapes. Oh, why should nature build so fouler then unless God's delight in tragedy? Give signs, sweet girl, for here were none but friends. What Roman lord it was durst do the deed? Or slunk not Saturnine as Tarquin erst that left the camp to sin in Lucre's bed? Sit down, sweet niece. Brother, sit down by me. Apollo, Pallas, Jove, or Mercury, inspire me that I may this treason find. My lord, look here. Look here, Lavinia. This sandy plot is plain. Guide, if thou canst this after me, when I have writ my name without the help of any hand at all. Curse be the heart that forced us to this shift. Right, thou good niece. And here display at last what God will have discovered for revenge. Heaven guide thy pen to print thy sorrows plain. 
that we may know the traitors and the truth. What do you read, my lord, was she had writ? Stuprin, Chiron, Demetrius. What? What the lustful sons of Tamara, performers of this heinous bloody deed. Magni Dominator Polly Tamlentus Audis Sclera, Tamlentus Vides. Oh, calm thee, gentle lord. Although I know there is enough written upon this earth to stir a mutiny in the mildest thoughts and arm the minds of infants to exclaims. My lord, kneel down with me. Lavinia, kneel. And kneel, sweet boy, the Roman Hector's hope. And swear with me, as with the woeful fair and father of that chaste, dishonored dame. Lord Junius Brutus, swear for Lucrece's rape that we will prosecute by good advice, mortal revenge upon these traitor Goths, and see their blood or die with this reproach. Tis sure enough, and you know how, but if you hunt these bear whelps, then beware, the dam will wake. And if she wind you once, she is with the lion deeply still in league, and lulls him while she playeth on her back, and when he sleeps, will she do what she list? You are a young huntsman, Marcus, let it alone, and come, I will go get a leaf of brass, and with a gad of steel will write these words, and lay it by. The angry northern wind will blow these sands like Sibyl's leaves abroad, and where's your lesson then? Boy, what say you? I say, my lord, that if I were a man, their mother's bedchamber should not be safe for these bad bondsmen to the yoke of Rome. Ay, that's my boy. Thy father hath full oft for his ungrateful country done the like. An uncle, so will I, and if I live, come, go with me into mine armory. Lucius, I'll fit thee. And with all my boy shall carry from me to the emperor's sons presents that I intend to send them both. Come, come, thou'lt do thy message, wilt thou not? Aye, with my dagger in their bosoms, grandsire. No, boy, not so. I'll teach thee another course. Lavinia! Mm -hmm. Come! Marcus, look to my house. Lucius and I'll go brave it at the court. Aye, marry we will, sir. And we'll be waited on. Oh, heavens, can you hear a good man groan and not relent or not compassion him? Marcus, attend him in his ecstasy that hath more scars of sorrow in his heart than foeman's marks upon his battered shield. But yet so just he will not revenge. Revenge, ye heavens, for old Andronicus! Uh, oh, Demetrius, it's son of Lucius! He has a message for us! My lords, with all the humbleness I may, I greet your honors from Andronicus, and pray the Roman gods confound you both. Gracie, love me, Lucius. What's the news? That you are both deciphered. That's the news for villains marked with rape. May I please you, my grandsire, well advised, hath sent by me the goodliest of weapons of his armory to gratify your honorable youth, the hope of Rome, for so he made me say, and so I do, and with his gifts present your lordships, that whenever you have need, you may be armed and appointed well. And so I leave you both. Like bloody villains! What's this? A scroll? It's clear. Written around about. What did you see? Integer vitae scolescre perus, non egot marie jacques nec accru? Oh! Tis a voice and horse. I know it well. I read in grammar long ago. Hi. Just a voice in Horace. Right, you have it. Oh, what a thing it is to be an ass. Here's no sound jest the old man hath found their guilt, as in them weapons wrapped around with lines. That wound, 
beyond their feeling to the quick. But were our witty empress well afoot, she would applaud Antronicus' conceit. But let her rest in her unrest a while. And now, young lords, was not a happy star, led us to Rome, strangers and more than so, captives to be advanced this height. It did me good before the palace gate to brave the tribune in his brother's hearing. But me more good to see so great a lord basely insinuate and send us gifts. <laughs> Had he not reason, Lord Demetrius? Did you not use his daughter very friendly? I would we had such a thousand Roman dames at such a babe by turn to serve our lust. A charitable wish and full of love. Here likes but your mother for to say amen, and that she would for twenty thousand more. Come, let us go and pray to all the gods for our beloved mother in her pains. Pray to the devils for the gods have given us over. Du -du -du -du. Why do the trumpets flourish thus? Belike, for joy, the emperor hath a son. Soft, who comes here? Enter a nurse with a blackmore child in her arms. Good morrow, our lords. Oh, tell me, did you see Aaron the moor? Well, more or less, or narrow wit at all, here Aaron is, and what with Aaron now? Oh, gentle Aaron! We are all undone! Now help, or woe betide thee evermore! Why, what a caterwauling dost thou keep! What dost thou wrap and fumble in thine arms? That which I would hide from heaven's eye! Our empress' shame and stately Rome's disgrace! She is delivered, Lord, she is delivered! To whom? I mean... She is brought a bed. Well, God give her good rest. <laughs> what hath he sent her? A devil! Why, then she is the devil's dam. A joyful issue. <laughs> a joyless, dismal, black, and sorrowful issue. Here is the babe. As loathsome as a toad amongst the fairest breeders of our clime, the Empress sends thee thy stamp, thy seal, and bids thee christen it with thy dagger's point. Zunes, ye whore, is black so base a hue? Sweet blouse, you are a beauteous blossom, sure. Villain, what hast thou done? That which thou canst not undo. Thou hast undone our mother. Villain. I have done thy mother, and therein, hellish dog, thou hast undone. Woe to her chance, and damned her loath choice, accursed the offspring of so foul a fiend. It shall not live. It shall not die. Aaron, it must. The mother wills it so. What? Must it, nurse? Then let no man but I do execution on my flesh and blood. I'll broach the tadpole on my rapier's point. Nurse, give it to me. My sword shall soon dispatch it. Sooner this sword shall plough thy bowels up. Stay, murderous villains, will you kill your brother? Now, by the burning tapers of the sky that shone so brightly when this boy was got, he dies upon my scimitar's sharp point that touches this, my firstborn son and heir. I tell you, younglings, not Enceladus with all his threatening band of Typhon's brood, nor great Alcides, nor the god of war shall seize this prey out of his father's hand. What, what, you, you sanguine, shallow-hearted boys, you white-limed walls, you alehouse-painted signs? Coal black is better than another hue, in that it scorns to bear another hue. For all the water in the ocean can never turn the swan's black legs to white, although she lave them hourly in the flood. <sighs> Tell the Empress from me I am of age to keep mine own. Excuse it how she can. Wilt thou betray thy noble mistress thus? My mistress is my mistress, this myself, the vigor and the picture of my youth. This before all the world do I prefer. 
This maugre all the world will I keep safe, or some of you shall smoke for it in Rome. By this our mother is forever shamed. Rome will despise her for this foul escape. The emperor in his rage will doom her death. Oh, I blush to think upon this ignominy. Why, there's the privilege your beauty bears. Fie, treacherous hue, that will betray with blushing the close enacting counsels of the heart. Here's a young lad framed of another leer. Look how the black slave smiles upon the father as who should say, old lad, I am thine own. He is your brother, lords, sensibly fed of that self-blood that first gave life to you. And from that womb where you imprisoned were, he is enfranchised and come to light. Nay, he is your brother by the surer side, although my seal be stamped in his face. Aaron, what shall I say unto the Empress? Advise thee, Aaron, what is to be done, and we will all subscribe to thy advice. Save thou the child, so we may all be safe. And sit we down, and let us all consult. My son and I will have the wind of you. Keep there. Now, talk at pleasure of your safety. How many women saw you this child of his? Why so brave, lords? When we join in league, I am a lamb. But if you brave the moor, the chafed boar, the mountain lioness, the ocean swells not so as there in storms. Say again. How many saw the child? Cornelia, the midwife, and myself, and no one else but the delivered empress. The empress, the midwife, and yourself. Two may keep counsel when the third's away. Go to the Empress, tell her this I said. Weak, weak, so cries a pig prepared to the spit. What meanest thou, Aaron? Wherefore didst thou this? Lord, sir, tis a deed of policy. Shall she live to betray this guilt of ours? A long-tongued, babbling gossip. No, lords, no. And now be it known to you my full intent. Not far one muley lives, a countryman. His wife but yesternight was brought to bed. His child is like to her, fair as you are. Go pack with him and give the mother gold and tell them both the circumstance of all, and how by this their child shall be advanced, and be received for the emperor's heir, and substituted in the place of mine to calm this tempest whirling in the court. And let the emperor dandle him for his own. Hark ye, lords, you see I have given her physic, and you must needs bestow her funeral. The fields are near, and you are gallant grooms. This done, see that you take no longer days, but send the midwife presently to me. The midwife and the nurse well made away, then let the ladies tell what they please. Aaron, I see that thou wilt not trust the heir with secrets. For this care of Tamara, herself and hers, are highly bound to thee. Now to the Goths, as swift as swallow flies, there to dispose this treasure in mine arms, and secretly to greet the Empress' friends. Come on, you thick-lipped slave, I'll bear you hence, for it is you that puts us to our shifts. I'll make you feed on berries and on roots, and feed on curds and whey, and suck the goat, and cabin in a cave, and bring you up to be a warrior, and command the camp. Enter Titus, bearing arrows with letters at the ends of them. With him, Marcus. Young Lucius, Publius, Sempronius, Caius, and other gentlemen with bows. Come, Marcus, 
Come, kinsman, this is the way. Sir, boy, now let me see your archery. Look ye, draw home enough, and tis there straight. Terrace Astrea reliquit. Be you remembered, Marcus, she's gone. She's fled. Sirs, take you to your tools. You, cousins, shall go sound the ocean and cast your nets. Haply you may catch her in the sea. Yet there's as little justice as at land. No, Publius and Sempronius, you must do it. Tis you must dig with mattock and with spade and pierce the inmost center of the earth. Then, when you come to Pluto's region, I pray you, deliver him this petition. Ding. Tell him it is for justice and for aid and that it comes from old Andronicus, shaken with sorrows in ungrateful Rome. Ah, Rome! Well, well, I made thee miserable. What time I threw the people's suffrages on him that doth tyrannize o'er me? Go, get you gone, and pray be careful all, and leave not a man of war unsearched. This wicked emperor may have shipped her hence in kinsmen. Then we may go pipe for justice. Oh, Publius, is this not a heavy case to see thy noble uncle thus distract? Therefore, my lord, it highly us concerns by day and night to attend him carefully, and feed his humor kindly as we may, till time begets some careful remedy. Kinsman, his sorrows are past remedy. Join with the Goths and with revengeful war, take wreak on Rome for this ingratitude, and vengeance on the traitor Satrine. Publius! How now? How now, my masters? What? Have you met with her? No, my good lord, but Pluto sends you word. If you will have revenge from hell, you shall. Marry for justice she is so employed. He thinks with Jove in heaven or somewhere else, so that perforce you must needs stay a time. He doth me wrong to feed me with delays. I'll dive into the burning lake below and pull her out of Acheron by the heels. Marcus, we are but shrubs. No cedars we, no big bone man framed of the cyclops size, but metal, Marcus, steel to the very back, yet wrung with wrongs more than our backs can bear. And since there's no justice in earth nor hell, we will solicit heaven and move the gods to send down justice for to wreak our wrongs. Come to this gear. You are a good archer, Marcus. At Jovum, that's for you here. At Polynum, at Martin, that's for myself. Here, boy, to Pallius. Here to Mercury, to Saturn and Caius, not to Saturnine. Dun, 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 dun. You were as good to shoot against the wind. <laughs> to it, boy. Marcus, loose when I bid. Of my word I have written to effect, there's not a god left unsolicited. Kinsmen, shoot all your shafts into the court. We will afflict the emperor in his pride. Now, masters, draw! Pew, pew, pew. Pew, 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 pew. Oh, well said, Lucius. Good boy in Virgo's lap. Give it, Pallas. I aim a mile beyond the moon. Your letter is with Jupiter by this. <laughs> Publius, Publius. What hast thou done? See, see, thou hast shot off one of Taurus's horns. <laughs> this was the sport, my lord. When Publius shot, the bull, being gull, gave Ares such a knock that down fell both the ram's horns in the court. And who should find them but the Empress villain? She laughed and told the more he should not choose but give them to his master for a present. Dun dun dun! Why, there it goes. God give his lordship joy. News, news from heaven. Marcus, the post is come. Sirrah, what tidings? Have you any letters? Shall I have justice? What says Jupiter? Oh, the gibbet maker. He says he has taken them all down again, for the man shall not be hanged till next week. But what says Jupiter, I ask thee? Alas, sir, I, I know not Jupiter, for I, I never drank with him in all my life. Why, villain, art thou not the carrier? Aye, of my pigeons, sir, nothing else. Why, didst thou not come from heaven? Oh, from heaven, alas, sir, I 
never came there. God forbid I should be so bold to press to heaven in my young days. Why, I'm going with my pigeons to the tribunal, plebes, to take up a matter of a brawl with my uncle and one of the imperial men. Why, sir, that is as fit as can be to serve for your oration and let him deliver the pigeons to the emperor from you. Tell me, can you deliver an oration to the emperor with a grace? Nay, truly, sir, I can never say grace in all my life. Sirrah, come hither, make no more ado, but give your pigeons to the emperor. By me, thou shalt have justice at his hands. Hold, hold, meanwhile, here's money for thy charges. Give me pen and ink. Sirrah, can you, with a grace, deliver a supplication? Aye, sir. Then here is a supplication for you. And when you come to him, at the first approach you must kneel, then kiss his foot, then deliver up your pigeons, and then look for your reward. I'll be at hand, sir. See you do it bravely. I warrant you, sir. Let me alone. Sirrah, hast thou a knife? Come, let me see it. Here, Marcus... Fold it in the oration, for thou hast made it like an humble suppliant, and when thou hast given it the emperor, knock at my door and tell me what he says. God be with you, sir, I will. Come, Marcus, let us go, Publius. Follow me. Why, lords, what wrongs are these? Was ever seen an emperor of Rome thus overborne, troubled, confronted thus, and for the extent of evil justice, used in such contempt. My lords, you know, as know the mightful gods, however these disturbers of our peace buzz in the people's ears, they're not have passed, but even with law against the willful sons of old Andronicus. And what and if his sorrows have so overwhelmed his wits Shall we be thus afflicted by his reeks, his fits, his frenzies, his bitterness? And now he writes to heaven for his redress. See, here's to Job, this to Mercury, this to Apollo, this to the god of war. Sweet scrolls to fly about the streets of Rome. What's this but libeling against the Senate? and blazoning the injustice everywhere. A goodly humor, is it not, my lords? As who would say in Rome no justice were? But if I live, his feigned ecstasy shall be no shelter to these outrages. But he and his shall know that justice lives in center in his health. Whom if she sleep, he'll so awake as she in fury shall cut off the proudest conspirator that lives. My gracious lord, my lovely Santorine, lord of my life, commander of my thoughts, calm thee and bear the faults of Titus's age, the effects of sorrow for his valiant sons, whose loss hath pierced him deep and scarred his heart, and rather comfort his distressed plight than prosecute the meanest or the best for these contempts. Why, thus it shall become, high-witted to glows withal, but Titus... I have touched thee to the quick, thy life blood out. If Aaron now be wise, then is all safe, the anchors in the port. Well, how now, good fellow, wouldst thou speak with us? Yea, forsooth, and your Mr. Ship be imperial. Empress I am, but yonder sits the emperor. "'Tis he, God and Saint Stephen, give you good den. "'I have brought you a letter and a couple of pigeons here. "'Go, take him away and hang him presently. "'How must, mo how must money must I have? "'Despiteful and intolerable wrongs. Shall I endure this monstrous villainy? 
I know from whence the same device proceeds. May this be born, as if his traitorous sons that died by law for murder of our brother have by my means been butchered wrongfully. Go, drag the villain hither by the hair. Nor age nor honor shall shape privilege. For this proud mock I'll be thy slaughter man. Sly frantic wretch that hopes to make me great, in hope thyself thou should govern Rome and me. What news with thee, Amelius? Arm, arm, my lord. Rome never had more cause. The Goths have gathered head, and with a power high resolved men, bent to the spoil they hither march amain, under conduct of Lucius, son to old Andronicus, who threats in course of this revenge to do as much as ever Coriolanus did. Is warlike Lucius general of the Goths? These tidings knit me, and I hang the head as flowers with frost, or grass beat down with storms. Ay, now begin our sorrows to approach. Tis he the common people love so much. Myself hath often overheard them say, when I have walked like a private man, that Lucius' banishment was wrongfully, and they have wished that Lucius were their emperor. Why should you fear? Is not your city strong? I, but the citizens favor Lucius, and will revolt for me to succor him. King, be thy thoughts imperious like thy name. Is the sun dimmed that gnats do fly in it? The eagle suffers little birds to sing, and is not careful what they mean thereby, knowing that with the shadow of his wings he can at pleasure stint their melody. Even so mayest thou the giddy men of Rome. Then cheer thy spirit, for know thou, emperor, I will enchant the old Andronicus with words more sweet and yet more dangerous than baits to fish or honey stalks to sheep. When, as the one is wounded with the bait, the other rotted with delicious feed. But he will not entreat his son for us. If Tamora entreat him, then he will. For I can smooth and fill his aged ear with golden promises. That were his heart almost impregnable. His old ear is deaf. Yet should both ear and heart obey my tongue. Go, though, before be our ambassador. Say that the emperor requests a parley of warlike Lucius and appoint the meeting, even at his father's house, the old Andronicus. Amelius, do this message honorably, and if he stand on hostage for his safety, let him demand what pledge will please him best. Your bidding shall I do effectually. Now will I to that old Andronicus and temper him with all the art I have, to pluck proud Lucius from the warlike Goths. And now, sweet emperor, be blithe again, and bury all thy fear in my devices. Then go successantly, and plead to him, Approved warriors and my faithful friends, I have received letters from great Rome which signify what hate they bear their emperor and how desirous of our sight they are. Therefore, great lords, be as your titles witness, imperious and impatient of your wrongs, and wherein Rome hath done you any scape, let him make treble satisfaction. Brave slip, sprung from the great Andronicus, whose name was once our terror, now our comfort, whose high exploits and honorable deeds in grateful Rome requites with foul contempt. Be bold in us. We'll follow where thou leadst, like stinging bees in hottest summer's day, led by their master to the flowered fields, and be avenged on cursed Tamara. And as he saith, so say we all with him. I humbly thank him, and I thank you all. But who comes here, led by a lusty Goth? Renowned Lucius, from our troops I strayed to gaze upon a ruinous monastery, and as I earnestly did fix mine eye upon the wasted building, suddenly I heard a child cry underneath the wall. I made unto the noise, when soon I heard the crying babe controlled with this discourse. Peace, tawny slave, half me and half thy dam. Did not thy hue array whose brat thou art, had nature lent thee but thy mother's look, 
villain, thou mightst have been an emperor. But where the bull and cow are both milk white, they never do beget a coal black calf. Peace, villain, peace. Even thus he rates the babe. Or must I bear thee to a trusty goth, who, when he knows thou art the empress babe, will hold thee dearly for thy mother's sake. With this, my weapon drawn, I rushed upon him, surprised him suddenly, and brought him hither, to use as you think needful of the man. O oh, worthy Goth, this is the incarnate devil that robbed Andronicus of his good hand. This is the pearl that pleased your empress eye. And here's the base fruit of his burning lust. Say, wall-eyed slave, whither wouldst thou convey this growing image of thy fiend-like face? Why dost not speak? What death? Not a word. A halter, soldiers, and hang him on this tree, and by his side his fruit of bastardy. Touch not the boy. He is of royal blood. Too like the sire for ever being good. First hang the child, that he may see it sprawl, a sight to vex the father's soul withal. Get me a ladder. Lucius, save the child, and bear it from me to the empress. If thou do this, I'll show thee wondrous things that highly may advantage thee to hear. If thou wilt not, befall what may befall. I'll speak no more, but vengeance wrought you all. Say on, and if it please me which thou speakest, thy child shall live, and I will see it nourished. And if it please thee, why surely, Lucius, twill vex thy soul to hear what I shall speak. For I must talk of murders, rapes, and massacres, acts of black night, abominable deeds, complots of mischief, treason, villainies, ruthful to hear, yet piteously performed. And this shall all be buried in my death, unless thou swear to me my child shall live. Tell on thy mind, I say thy child shall live. Swear that he shall. And then I will begin. Who should I swear by? Thou believest no God. That granted, how canst thou believe an oath? What if I do not? As indeed, I do not. Yet for I know thou art religious, and hast a thing within thee called conscience, with twenty popish tricks and ceremonies which I have seen thee careful to observe. Therefore I urge thy oath, for that I know an idiot holds his bauble for a god, and keeps the oath which by that god he swears. To that I'll urge him, therefore thou shalt vow by that same god, what god soe'er it be, that thou adorest and hast in reverence to save my boy, to nourish and bring him up, or else I will discover naught to thee. Even by God, I swear to thee, I will. First, know thou, I begot him on the empress. O most insatiate and luxurious woman. Tut, Lucius, this was but a deed of charity to that which thou shalt hear of me anon. Twas her two sons that murdered Bassianus. They cut thy sister's tongue and ravished her, and cut her hands and trimmed her as thou sawest. O oh, detestable villain, call'st thou that trimming? Why, she was washed and cut and trimmed, and twas trim sport for them that had the doing of it. O oh, barbarous, beastly villains like thyself! Indeed, I was their tutor to instruct them. That codding spirit had they from their mother, as sure a card as ever won the set. That bloody mind, I think, they learned of me, as true a dog as ever fought at head. Well, let my deeds be witness of my worth. 
I trained thy brethren to that guileful hole where the dead corpse of Bassianus lay. I wrote the letter that thy father found and hid the gold within the letter mentioned, confederate with the queen and her two sons. And what not done that thou hast caused to rue wherein I had no stroke of mischief in it? I played the cheater for thy father's hand, and, when I had it, drew myself apart, and almost broke my heart with extreme laughter. <laughs> I pried me through the crevice of a wall when his and he had his two sons' heads, beheld his stern and laughed so heartily <laughs> that both my eyes were raining like to his, and when I told the empress of the spot, she swoon almost at my pleasing till, and for my tidings gave me twenty kisses. <laughs> what canst thou say all this? I never blush. Hi, like a black dog, as the saying is, are thou not sorry for this and you not did? Aye, that I had not done a thousand more. Even now I curse the day, and yet I think few come within the compass of my curse. When I did, I did not sum the terrors ill as I kill a man or health device his death, ravish a maid or plot the way to do it. I kill some innocent and forswore myself, set deadly immunity between two friends. <sighs> Make poor men's cattle break their neck. Set fire to barns and haystacks in the night, and bid the owners quench them with their tears. Oft have I digged up dead men from their graves, and set them upright at their dear friends' doors, even when their sorrows almost were forgot. And on their skins, as on the bark of trees, have with my knife carved in Roman letters, let not your sorrow die, though I am dead. Tut, I have done a thousand dreadful things, as willingly as one would kill a fly. And nothing grieves me heartily and deep, but that I cannot do ten thousand more. Bring down the devil. He must not die so sweet a death as hanging presently. If there be devils, would I were a devil to live and burn in everlasting fire so that I might have your company in hell, but to torment you with my bitter tongue. Sirs, stop his mouth and let him speak no more. My lord, there is a messenger from Rome who desires to be admitted to your presence. Let him come near. Welcome, Emilius. What's the news from Rome? Lord Lucius, and you princes of the Goths, the Roman emperor greets you all by me. And for he understands you are in arms, he craves a parley at your father's house, willing you to demand your hostages, and they shall be delivered. What says our general? Emilius, let the emperor give his pledges unto my father and my uncle Marcus, and we will come. March away. And thus, in this strange and sad habiliment, I will encounter Andronicus, and say I am revenge, sent from below to join with him and right his heinous wrong. Knock at his study, where they say he keeps to ruminate strange plots of dire revenge. Tell him revenge has come to join with him and work confusion on his enemies. Who doth molest my contemplation? Is it your trick to make me ope the door, that so my sad decrees may fly away, and all my study be to no effect? You are deceived. For what I mean to do, see here in bloody lines I have set down, and what is written shall be executed. Titus, I am come to talk with thee. No, not a word. How can I grace my talk, wanting a hand to give it action? Thou hast the odds of me, therefore no more. If thou didst know me, thou wouldst talk with me. I am not mad. I know thee well enough. Witness this wretched stump. 
Witness these crimson lines. Witness these trenches made by grief and care. Witness the tiring day and heavy night. Witness all sorrow that I know thee well. For our proud empress, mighty Tamora, is not thou coming from my other hand? No, thou sad man, I am not Tamora. She is thy enemy, and I thy friend. I am revenge, sent from the infernal kingdom to ease the gnawing vulture of thy mind by working wreakful vengeance on thy foe. Come down and welcome me to this world's light. Confer with me of murder and of death. There's not a hollow cave or lurking place, no vast obscurity or misty veil where bloody murder or detested rape can couch or fear, but I will find them out and in their ears tell them my dreadful name, Revenge, which makes the foul offender quick. Art thou revenge? And art thou sent to me to be a torment to mine enemies? I am. Therefore, come down and welcome me. Do me some service ere I come to thee. Lo, and by thy side where rape and murder stands. Now give me some assurance that thou art revenge. Stab them, or tear them on thy chariot wheels and then i'll come and be thy wagoner and whirl along with thee about the globe provide thee two proper palfreys black as jet to hail thy vengeful wagon on swift way and find out murderers in their guilty caves and when thy car is loaded with their heads I'll dismount and by thy wagon wheel trot like a servile footman all day long. Even from Hyperion's rising in the east until his very downfall in the sea. And day by day I'll do this heavy task so thou destroy rapine and murder there. These are my ministers, and come with me. Are these thy ministers? What are they called? Rapine and murder. Therefore called so, because they take vengeance on such kind of men. Good Lord, how like the Empress's sons they are. And you, the Empress, but... We worldly men have miserable, mad, mistaking eyes. Oh, sweet revenge, now do I come to thee. And if one arm's embracement will content thee, I will embrace thee in it by and by. This closing with him fits his lunacy. Whate'er I forge to feed his brain-sick fits, do you uphold and maintain in your speeches. For now, he firmly takes me for revenge. And being credulous in this mad thought, I'll make him send for Lucius his son. And whilst I at a banquet hold him sure, I'll find some cunning practice out of hand to scatter and disperse the giddy Goths, or at least make them his enemy. See. Here he comes, and I must ply my theme. Welcome, dread fury, to my woeful house. Long have I been forlorn, and all for you. Repine and murder, you are welcome too. Hmm. How like the Empress and her sons you are. Well are you fitted. Had you but a more. Could not all a hell afford you such a devil? For well, I want the Empress never wags, but in her company there's a more, and would you represent the Queen aright, it would convenient you had such a devil. But welcome you are. What shall we do? What wouldst thou have us do, Andronicus? Show me a murderer! I'll deal with him! Show me a villain that hath done a rape, and I will be sent to be revenged on him. Show me a thousand that have done thee wrong, and I will be revenged on them all. Mm, look about the wicked streets of Rome. And when thou find'st a man that's like thyself, good murder, stab him. He's a murderer. 
go thou with him, and when it is to find another that is like to thee, good rapine, stab him, he is a ravisher. Go thou with them, and in the emperor's court there is a queen attended by a moor. Well mayst thou know her by thy own proportion, for up and down she doth resemble thee. I pray thee, do on them some violent death. They have been violent to me and mine. Well hast thou lessened us, this shall we do. But would it please thee, good Andronicus, to send for Lucius, thy thrice valiant son, who leads toward Rome a band of warlike Goths, and bid him come and banquet at thy house. When he is here, even at thy solemn feast, I will bring in the empress and her sons, the emperor himself and all thy foes, and at thy mercy shall they stoop and kneel, and on them shalt thou ease thy angry heart. What says Andronicus to this device? Marcus, my brother, tis sad Titus calls. Go, gentle Marcus, to thy nephew Lucius. Thou shalt have to inquire him out among the gods. Bid him repair to me, and bring with him some of his chiefest princes of the gods. Bid him encamp his soldiers where they are. Tell him the emperor and the empress feast at my house, and he shall feast with them too. This do thou for my love, and so let him, as he regards his aged father's life. This will I do, and soon return again. Now will I hence about thy business and take my ministers along with me. Uh, nay, let rape and murder stay with me, or I'll have to call my brother back again and uh, cleave to no revenge but Lucius. What say you, boys? Will you bide with him while I go tell my lord the emperor how I governed a determined jest? Yield to his humor. Smooth and speaking fair, and tarry with him till I turn again. I know them all, though they suppose me mad, and will all reach them in their own devices. Pair of cursed hellhounds. Madam, depart at pleasure, leave us here. Farewell, Andronicus. Revenge now goes to lay a complot to betray thy foes. I know thou dost, and sweet revenge, farewell. Tell us, old man, how shall we be employed? Tut, I have work enough for you to do. Publius, come hither, Caius, and Valentine. What is your will? Know you these two? The Empress' sons? I take them, Chiron and Demetrius. Fie, Publius, fie! Thou art too much deceived. The one is murder, rape is the other's name, and therefore bind them, gentle Publius, Caius, and Valentine. Lay hands on them! Oft have you heard me wish for such an hour, and now I find it. Therefore bind them sure and stop their mouths if they begin to cry. Villains, forbear, we are the Empress's sons. And therefore do we what we are commanded. Stop close their mouths, let them not speak a word. Is he sure bound? Look that you bind them fast. Come, come, Lavinia, look, thy foes are bound. Sirs, stop their mouths, let them not speak to me, but let them hear what fearful words I utter. O oh, villains, here stands the spring that you have stained with mud, this goodly summer with your winter mixed. You killed her husband, and for that vile fault two of her brothers were condemned to death. My hand cut off and made merry jest, both of her hands and tongue, and more dear than hands or tongue, her Spotless chastity, inhuman traitors, have constrained and forced. What would you say if I should let you speak? 
villains for shame, you could not beg for grace. Ah, wretches, how I mean to martyr you. This one hand yet is left to cut your throats, whilst that livinia tween her stumps doth hold, the basin that receives your guilty blood. You know your mother means to feast with me, and calls herself revenge, and thinks me mad. Hark, villains, I will grind your bones to dust, and with your blood, and it I'll make a paste, and of the paste a coffin I will rear, to make two Pasties of your shameful heads, and bid that strumpet, your unhallowed dam, like to the earth swallow her own increase. This is the feast that I have bid her to, and this the banquet she shall serve it on. For worse than Philomel, you used my daughter, and worse than Progne, I will be revenged. And now prepare your throats, Lavinia. Come. Receive the blood, and when that they are dead, let me go grind their bones to powder small, and with this hateful liquor temper it, and in this paste let their vile heads be baked. Come, come, be every one officious to make this banquet, which I wish may prove more stern and bloody than the centaur's feast. So now bring them in, for I'll play the cook, and see them ready against their mother comes. Uncle Martius, since it is my father's mind that I repair to Rome, I am content. And ours with thine, befall what fortune will. Good uncle, take you this barbarous moor, this ravenous tiger, this accursed devil, let him receive no sustenance, fetter him till he be brought unto the empress's face for testimony of her foul proceedings and see the ambush of our friends be strong, I fear the emperor means no good to us. Some devil whisper curses in mine ear, and prompt me that my tongue may utter forth the venomous malice of my swelling heart. Away, inhuman dog, unhallowed slave! Sirs, help our uncle to convey him in. The trumpets show the emperor is at hand. What? Hath the firmament more sons than one? What boots it thee to call thyself a son? Rome's emperor and nephew, break the parley. These quarrels must be quietly debated. The feast is ready, which the careful Titus hath ordained to an honourable end. For peace, for love, for league, and good to Rome, Please you, therefore, draw nigh and take your places. Marcus, we will. Welcome, my gracious lord. Welcome, dread queen. Welcome, ye warlike goths. Welcome, Lucius. And welcome all, although to cheer be poor. To fulfill your stomachs, please you eat of it. Why art thou thus attired, Andronicus? because I would be sure to have all well, to entertain your highness and your empress. We are beholding to you, good Andronicus. And if your highness knew my heart, ye were. My lord the emperor, resolve me this. Was it well done of rash Virginius to slay his daughter with his own right hand because she was enforced, stained, and deflowered? It was, Andronicus. Your reason, mighty lord? Because the girl should not survive her shame, and by her presence renew his sorrows. A reason mighty, strong, and effectual. A pattern, precedent, and lively warrant. For me, most wretched to perform the like. I, Lavinia, and I shame with thee. What hast thou done, unnatural and unkind? Her for whom my tears have made me blind. I am as woeful as Virginius was, and, to have, and have a thousand times more than he to do this outrage. And now, I have done. Was she ravished? Tell, who did the deed? You eat will please your highness feed. Why hast thou slain thine only daughter thus? 
Eh? Twas Chiron and Demetrius, they ravished her and cut away her tongue. And they, twas they, that did her all this wrong. Fetch them hither to us presently. There they are both baked in that pie, whereof their mother daintily hath fed, eating the flesh that she herself hath bred. Tis true, tis true. Witness my knife's sharp point. Die, frantic wretch, for this accursed deed. Can the sons I behold his father bleed? There's meat for me. Death is a deadly deed! You sad-faced men, people and sons of Rome, by uproar severed like a flight of fowls, scattered by winds and high tempestuous gusts, oh, let me teach you how to knit again this scattered corn into one mutual sheaf, these broken limbs again into one body, lest Rome herself be bane unto herself, and she whom mighty kingdoms curtsy to, like a forlorn and desperate castaway, do shameful execution on herself. But if my frosty signs and chaps of age, grave witnesses of true experience, cannot induce you to attend my words. Speak, Rome's dear friend, as erst our ancestor, when, with his solemn tongue, he did discourse to lovesick Dido's sad, attending ear, the story of that baleful burning night when subtle Greeks surprised King Priam's Troy. Tell us what Sinon hath bewitched our ears, or who hath brought the fatal engine in that gives our Troy, our Rome, the civil wound. My heart is not compact of flint, nor steel, nor can I utter all our bitter grief. But floods of tears will drown my oratory and break my utterance even in the time when it should move you to attend me most, rending your kind commiseration. Here's a captain. Let him tell the tale. Your hearts will throb and weep to hear him speak. Then, noble auditory, be it known to you that the cursed Chiron and Demetrius were they that murdered our emperor's brother. And they, it were, that ravished our sister. For their fell faults, our brothers were beheaded, our father's tears despised and basely cozen. Of that true hand that fought Rome's quarrel out and sent her enemies down to the grave. Lastly, myself kindly banished. The gates shut on me and turned weeping out. I had to beg relief among Rome's enemies, who drowned their enmity in my true tears, and oped their arms to embrace me as a friend. I am the turned for, be it known to you, that have preserved her welfare in my blood. And from her bosom they took the enemy's point, sheathing the steel in my adventurous body. Alas, you know, I am no vaunter. My, I, my scars, can witness, dumb although they are, that my report is just and full of truth. But soft, methinks I do digress too much, citing my worthless praise. Oh, pardon me, when, for when no friends are by, men praise themselves. Now it is my turn to speak. Behold this child. Of this was Tamara delivered the issue of an irreligious moor, chief architect and plotter of these woes. The villain is alive in Titus's house, and as he is to witness this is true. Now judge what cause had Titus to revenge. These wrongs unspeakable, past patience, and more than any living man could bear. Now you have heard the truth. What say you, Romans? Have we done aught amiss? Show us where within, and from the place where you behold us now, the poor remainder of Androgenici will hand in hand, all headlong cast us down on the ragged stones, beat forth our brains, and will make a mutual closure of our house. Speak, Romans, speak. 
And if you say we shall, lo, hand in hand, Lucius and I will fall. Come, come, thou reverend men of Rome, and bring our emperor gently in thy hand. Lucius, our emperor, for well I know the common voice do cry, it shall be so. Go, go into old Titus's sorrowful house, and hither hail that misbelieving Moor to be adjudged some direful slaughtering death as punishment for his most wicked life. Lucius, Lucius hail, 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 Thanks, gentle Romans. May I govern so to heal Rome's harms and wipe away her woe. But gentle people, give me aim a while, for nature puts me to a heavy task. Stand all aloof, but, uncle, draw you near, to shed obsequious tears upon this trunk. Oh, take this warm kiss on thy pale, cold lips. These sorrowful drops upon thy blood-stained face, the last true duties of thy noble son. Dear for dear, and loving kiss for kiss, thy brother Marcus tenders on thy lips. Oh, were the sum of these that yet I should pay, countless and infinite, yet I would pay them. Come hither, boy. Come, come and learn of us to melt in showers, Thy grandsire loved thee well. Many a time he danced thee on his knee, sung thee asleep, his loving breast thy pillow. Many a matter hath he told to thee, meet and agreeing with thine infancy. In that respect then, like a loving child, shed yet some small drops from thy tender spring, because kind nature doth require it so. Friends should associate friends in grief and woe Bid him farewell. Commit him to the grave. Do him that kindness and take leave of him. O oh, grandsire, grandsire, even with all my heart, would I were dead, so you did live again. O oh, Lord, I cannot speak to him for weeping. My tears will choke me if I open my mouth. You sad and drawn, Chini have done with woes. Give sentence of this execrable wretch that hath been breeder of this dire events. Set him breast deep in earth and famish him. There, let him stand and rave and cry for food. If anyone relieves or pities him for the offense, he dies. This is our doom. Some stay to see him fastened in the earth. Why should wrath be mute and fury dumb? I am no baby. I, that with base prayers I should repent the evils I have done. Ten thousand worse than ever yet I did would I perform if I might have my will. If one good deed in all my life I did, I do repent it from my very soul! <laughs> Some loving friend, convey the emperor hence and give him burial in his father's grave. My father in Lavinia will forthwith be closed in our household's monument. As for that ravenous tiger, Tamara, no funeral rite, no man in mourning weed, no mournful bell to ring her burial, but throw her forth to beasts and birds to pray. Her life was beastly and devoid of pity and being dead. Let birds on her take pity. Who will believe my verse in time to come If it were filled with your most high Desserts. 
No, yet heaven knows it's just a tune Which hides your life and shows not half your part If I could write the beauty of your eyes And in fresh numbers number all your graces Age to come would say this poet lies Such heavenly touches Never touched earthly faces Who will believe my first in time to come If it were filled with your most high dessert So should my papers yellowed with their age Be scorned like all men of less truth and time